fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through my fearful path, for my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Those He saves are His delight. Christ will hold me fast. Precious in His holy sight, He will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost, His promises shall last. But by Him at such a cost, He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. Savior's 
This morning we're beginning a series on the topic of Advent, the season of Advent, and uh, that may be a term you're not really familiar with, so I want to spend some time this morning getting you acquainted with it. Uh, Advent is a term that quite literally means arrival, but that doesn't help you much, right, unless you know a little of the context of where that word comes from. Advent, as a description of a season, comes from the traditional Christian calendar. Uh, the traditional Christian calendar is just another calendar in a sense. Uh, it's not something you get straight out of the Bible or anything like that, but neither is any other calendar, the school calendar or the national calendar or the calendar on your wall. They all come from somewhere. And uh, I'm kind of fond of the Christian calendar, the traditional one, because of the value it has in replaying and retelling the story of Jesus throughout the year. So if you were to take out the Christian traditional calendar, it would look something like this picture of a round circle. Uh, at least this is one representation of it. The first half of the year deals with the story of Jesus. And so uh, the liturgical calendar begins at the end of November, if you can believe that. I know it's strange, but here we go. Uh, so you are right there at the beginning of the ancient church calendar. And the first season of that is called Advent. Uh, from there, it tells the story of the birth of Christ around Christmas, uh, traditionally, you would tell the story of the suffering and temptation of Christ during Lent. You'd tell about the death of Christ during the week before Easter. You'd talk about the resurrected Christ from Easter until Pentecost. And then beginning in the season following Pentecost, you'd have what's called ordinary time. Uh, and that's the time of the life of the church. In the same way, the first half of the year is about the story of Jesus. The second half of the year is about the church, and so you'd read a lot from the epistles, uh, from the heroes of the Old Testament that teach us how to live stories of faith, and so forth. So Advent would be the season that comes right before Christmas. Uh, in your mind, you might have associated Advent and Christmas. They're not the same thing, actually quite different. Uh, Advent is what comes before Christmas. It's a time of waiting and anticipation. And it's part of a, a three-part series of events. The Advent is the waiting, which emphasizes the story of Israel waiting for its Messiah. Christmas is the arrival of God. And then Epiphany, which would follow that, is the story of God being made known to the nations. Um, Advent, as far as we're concerned, what are we going to do with it? Why am I preaching about it? Uh, it Advent, again, means the arrival of and it has the sense of waiting for the arrival of God. Christ is born on the season of Christmas is the way the story, you know, in the traditional calendar goes. And so Advent is the time when the church thinks about what it means to wait until Christ arrives, till God arrives. So probably the only part of Advent that you're really familiar with would be the Advent calendar. You may have seen these. And it's the idea of counting down the days until Christmas. And it's about building anticipation. So the themes of Advent, if you were to preach on it uh, like preachers of years gone by have done, there's three big themes, and we're going to have three lessons over the coming weeks today, uh, the next one and the one after that, leading up to Christmas, uh, on the themes of Advent, which are these. Number one, you need to be patient. It's about waiting, longing, and expectation. Number two is the certainty that God, in fact, will come. And then number three, uh, this is the ethical part, God will come, but you're not ready yet. <laughs> you know, There's a reason that we wait. We wait because we're getting ready for God to come. If God were to come right now, uh, I think most of us would be caught off guard. 
And, and so whether it's the second coming of Christ in our own time or waiting for the Messiah to arrive in the New Testament, um, we're always just kind of unprepared when God finally does show up. It seems like all we do is wait, 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 and then we're not ready. Kind of like Christmas, actually. You wait, 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 and then that day or the day before, you're running around doing all your last-minute errands. And that's kind of the idea. One of these days, God is going to show up and do great things. And until then, we're supposed to wait patiently and be ready. So today, we're going to talk about that need to be patient. And the question we want to ask is, why isn't God doing something right now? Why, why isn't it immediate? We live in a world of instant gratification. You get whatever you want right now. And we kind of wonder, why, why isn't God doing that? I, I literally got a message not very long ago from a, a Christian person saying, you know, hey, why isn't God doing something about the coronavirus? Isn't it time? I mean, we, we waited, we were patient, months passed. We're still there and still struggling with this thing. Why doesn't God, poof, you know, make it disappear? Why isn't God doing something immediately? Why isn't he just coming down out of the sky and making the world right? Isaiah 64 is a wonderful psalm. Um, I say it's a psalm. I know it's in Isaiah, but it's it's a song. It's a, a piece of poetry written about waiting for God. Uh, and if you look at the text, it begins with these words in verses 1 and 2. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, and that the nations might tremble at your presence. The first problem is we really want God to act, like immediately. We want, and not subtle action, we want big time action. We want brush fire action, boil the pot action. We want heat, fire, flame. We want God to do something, to tear the sky open and come down and do whatever it is he says he's going to do. We want God to act right now. Verse 3 when you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. That verse is a callback to the story of Mount Sinai and the reception of the law of Moses. How they said, we weren't really even looking for you. And there you were at that mountain. You met us there and you did. You tore the sky open. You came down to Mount Sinai, thunder and lightning and cloud and smoke. And it was amazing. Doesn't that give you confidence that God's going to act now? Well, kind of, but also it kind of makes the problem worse. Because we know God has acted in the past, we wonder why he's not doing something right now. Every Sunday we go to church and we hear stories about miracles and healings and resurrection and wonderful things. But then in our experience, we look around and say, I, I don't see God doing that. God used to act. We were told stories that you do this kind of thing, but it seems like now you don't. So verse 4, From of old no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. Not only does God act, we want him to act. We know he used to act, and he's the only one that ever has. There's a reason we're asking God and not Baal. Baal never does anything. But according to our faith, according to our stories, God does act. He does something in history. He shows up when there's a problem, and he makes things right again. So this is the three-part problem of Isaiah 64. We really want you to act right now. We remember that you used to do things, and we wonder why you're not doing it now. And we have no one else to turn to but you. And so this little chapter is kind of a lament about where did God go, and why isn't he doing anything right now? The hint in that last verse was God does great things for those who wait. And we're just really bad about waiting. But something wonderful does happen when you wait. You spend a little time thinking and considering why isn't God doing anything? Verse 5 is the turning point in the story. You meet him who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember you in your ways. We know, we believe that God comes to meet the person who acts righteously. And while we're waiting, we start to think about that idea. We want God to act. God used to act. No one else but God acts. And in fact, we believe as a matter of fact that God does meet the righteous person. 
what if I'm the problem? So the second half of that verse says, Behold, you are angry, and we sinned. In our sins, we have been a long time, and shall we be saved? See the question? Because God didn't act immediately in the way that they wanted, it gave them time to wait and to think about themselves and to ask, what if God isn't the problem? What if it isn't God isn't doing what I want him to do? What if it's my fault? What if I have made this world a lousy place? What if I'm the one holding God at a distance? What if this is my problem? not the fault of God, just forgetting to show up. And so verse 6 says, yeah, actually, that's the story. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Actually, it is my fault. I, When I have the time to wait and be patient and reflect, I'm not this perfectly righteous person who deserves God to come down and do something on my behalf. Actually, no, I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm part of the problem. Even my good things are bad things. <laughs> That's this verse there. Even your righteous deeds are as filthy garments, polluted garments, that even when you do something good, you, you sneak in a bad motive. That's the kind of people we are. Oh, it, it is our fault. It's not just a question of where God go. In the waiting, we have a moment to reflect and say, oh, Maybe I have a role in this. Verse 7 expands it further. There is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. Maybe the reason things aren't going well right now, says Isaiah, is because I am not actually asking God for help. When God doesn't show up, I say, oh, hey, where's God? Why isn't he doing something? But I never stop to ask, did I ever ask him to do anything? Did I depend on him? Or did I trust in my own ways and fill my life with sin? Maybe there's more to this than just God didn't show up. What if this is our fault? Oh, it is my fault. And then the third thing Isaiah points out is we're actually all to blame for the problems we see in the world. So in the waiting, then, we learned something. If God had come immediately and just fixed our problem, we wouldn't have learned the part we played in our problem. So verse 8 says, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. That's not how the story started. The beginning of the chapter was a demand. God, why don't you show up and do something? But then by the end, after the waiting, after the reflection, he's able to say, okay, now I know. Now I know I'm to blame. Now I know I have a part in this. You're the father, you're the potter, and I'm the clay, and I need to wait for you. Now I need to repent. I need to actually cry out to God. Be not so terribly angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look. We are all your people. We repent now, and we say, please return to us. Because we've waited and we learned something in that waiting. We learned how much we need you. Why isn't God doing something right now, immediately, that I want? The answer might be, some things are only learned while waiting. Why doesn't the Messiah just drop out of the sky in the Old Testament and fulfill all their hopes and dreams? Why do they have to wait for him? Because there's something learned in waiting. Why hasn't Christ come back right now and fixed everything that's wrong in my life? Because we learn something when we're waiting. Because there's value in that that we can't get any other way. James 5, 7 and 8 says it this way. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. God is going to show up. That's the kind of God he is. But he doesn't show up on my schedule. In fact, quite often, he allows me to wait, because I learn something about him and about myself in the waiting. So take a moment 
in this season before Christmas, before it all happens, and spend some time thinking about waiting, anticipation, yearning, and desire of wanting God to come and what we learn while we wait. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the For communion today, uh, we have a video that uh, we've put together, um, a couple of these videos in a row, one for this week and next week and the week after, some we found online, some we spliced together. But something I was thinking about while Christmas is coming up, um, I love old Christmas hymns, really old ones, older the better, at least a century old. Um, and one thing you'll notice about them is that the older hymns not only talked about the birth of Christ, they talked about the gospel of Christ, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. And so what I'm going to do today and in the next couple of weeks is uh, play some reflection videos at the time of communion that give you an opportunity to hear those hymns in a different context, away from the manger and away from the stable and away from Bethlehem, and instead hear them again in Jerusalem at the cross. Would you bow with me as we bless the bread and the wine? Our Father and our God, we thank you for this day and the blessings of it, and we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on our behalf. We thank you for the bread, and we thank you for the wine that is to us the body and blood of our Lord, 
Help us to take it in a manner worthy of him. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, that mourns in lonely exile here, until the Son of God appears. Spring from on high in course thy light on us to ride disperse the gloomy clouds of night in death's dark shadow put to flight rejoice Turn the key to heaven's door Be thou our comforter and guide And lead us to the Father's side Rejoice, rejoice Rejoice, rejoice, amen.